take a moment to pray together. <clears throat> Lord of hosts, giver of all that's good, we're grateful that you've given us a word so that we're not lost and wondering, but have something to guide us. Holy Spirit, we pray today as we look at your word that you gave us through Luke, that you would be our teacher, and that that which is said would not hit as just words to bounce off, but rather that you take your truth and put it in our hearts and that the result would be your people are built up. So we present ourselves to you, longing for your grace, Holy Spirit, for your work in us. And we pray not in our name, because there's nothing there that's worthy before you, but we pray instead in Christ's name, who took our place, died for us, and therefore is the one in whose name we can come and pray. And we pray now in his name. Amen. As you look at your bulletin, it tells you that the uh, text for today is Luke 5, verse 11. Uh, that's a testimony to uh, the problems of texting. <clears throat> I texted Bryant. It's going to be Luke 5, 1 through 11. At least I thought I'd texted that. And he sent, Ben. I gave him the title for it, and he sent back 5 through 11, 5, 1 through, or 5, uh, 11. And I kind of looked at it and saw Luke 5, and then the last numbers are 1. So I texted back, right, that's right. And he checked again, and I was wrong both times. <clears throat> so the text today is not one verse, but the first 11 verses of chapter 5. You know, when we read, we hit the front and the back of the word, and what's in the middle is relatively less important. Uh, but it probably would be good to get the sermon text right. So we come today <clears throat> to look then at uh, Luke chapter 5. I'm going to read it, and then we'll set it in its context. And I'm reading here from the uh, NIV with a few changes uh, to reflect, I think, more precisely the Greek that we're looking at. So one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were mending their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he'd finished speaking, <clears throat> he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, teacher, we worked all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done so, <clears throat> they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they'd taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. And so they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything and followed him. God's word, carefully, carefully presented by Luke. I'd like to take just a little time as we come up to this text <clears throat> to set it in its context. I do remember the first time I looked at the Bible, I was not at all a believer, and here's little event and little event, and it didn't make much sense to me. <clears throat> Never occurred to me that Luke's gospel, for instance, was not just an accident, but something he carefully composed. So I'd like this morning to take just a couple of minutes, well, well maybe if you're more than a couple, but <clears throat> take a little time to look at the start of Luke's gospel and then to watch him develop it up to the point of our text for today. So we go to chapter 1, and Luke writes, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were the first, who were from the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. So Luke is telling us he very specifically researched things, talked to the people who'd been there, and now has structured an account for us. It's not a random account. It's not just a string of events put together. 
If we had a, a birthday party, some of you have done that. I do remember birthday parties. Actually, I'm one of five boys. Birthday parties were chaos. And friends come over and they're running all over. But think of a birthday party. And then we're going to interview the people who were there. So what was it like for you? Oh, well, I remember when I put my face in the cake. I do remember actually doing that once. Uh, a, a minimal assist from a brother. And it is not fun. And then my brother, if he were to tell you about it, I think he'd have a very different account of putting my face in the cake. And then others could talk about the nice gift that was open or could talk about the drinks. And if we put together the account of 10 people having one birthday party, think how many accounts you'd have. Think of all the details and how they felt about it. Well, it's not other than that. It's not birthday parties, but it's not other than that in Luke's account. He's talked to a lot of people about these events, and he's talked to people who were there. And then he's assembled it. That means he chose to put his focus on some parts, not others. How full could this text be? Oh, my. We could talk about the nets and mending the nets, and we could talk about the boat, and we could talk to the people on the shore who wondered what was going on. There are all kinds of things we could have. But Luke is carefully chosen all the way through his gospel. And I'd like to walk with you up through the layout to chapter 5, because Luke has very, very clearly chosen his text to, to set us up for the events of chapter 5. Luke is talking about the arrival of the Christ, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Anointed One. And in, in Greek, in Hebrew, uh, Christos, Mashiach, mean Anointed One. So he's talking about the arrival of this one. And he begins by talking about the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus, relatives. And he talks about John as the one of whom the Lord had spoken in the prophets, who would be the forerunner of the Christ. And John comes, he carefully, uh, Luke carefully gives us not only a description of the births, but then he talks in chapter 3 about John beginning to preach announcing the Lord is coming, make the Lord's way straight. Now we're in somewhat hilly Mississippi, and if you drive on the Natchez Trace, for instance, and just look alongside it, you'll see the hills kind of going like this, you know, and if you drive them, it's terrible. <clears throat> but what have we done? Well, what, what did they do? Big equipment, we've put in all the dirt that was on top of one hill in between, so you drive the trace and it's straight. And John is saying, make straight the ways of the Lord. Raise up the valleys, level out the hills, because the king is coming. And when John made that announcement, he said, and therefore, we need to repent, because the king who is holy is coming, and we're not. And so John the Baptist, or John the washer, is coming to announce to God's people, the king is coming, and then they would come to acknowledge their sin, to repent of it, and he would wash a picture of God's cleansing his sinful people. The Lord actually preparing them to meet the holy God. And they would come, confessing their sin. And John recognizes the one who's coming after him, whose sandals he's not even worthy to undo, who's going to baptize with fire and with the Holy Spirit. This one's coming. And, and John was saying, get ready. This is serious business. And then, of course, Jesus appears. And John says, well, wait a minute. It's not that I should be baptizing you. You're the one who baptizes us. And Jesus, who was not coming to judge yet, but to take the place of the guilty people, says to John, John, go ahead and baptize me. We have to do what's right. And John goes ahead and does that, recognizing that the one he's baptizing is, is the holy one. But of course, Jesus was coming first to take our judgment, which is a good thing for us, though at a terrible price for him. And after Luke's account of the Messiah coming, identifying with us, he describes Jesus going into the wilderness to be tempted. And there he faces the temptations that you and I have gone for. And Jesus faithfully walks before God, taking our place so that it's not just that when we're forgiven, we're back to zero. He walked righteously. So when we go before God, his obedience is counted to us. That's an amazing thing. So Luke very carefully describes then the announcement of the births of these two, the ministry of John pointing to Jesus, Jesus coming to begin to stand in our place. 
And that gets us up to uh, chapter 4 and about the middle, when Jesus comes away from the temptation, now having identified with God's people, he goes to bring the good news. And so we learn that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him went throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and, and people praised him. He went and he began to teach and to announce and to do healing things, and word got around very quickly. Well, how big is Galilee where he went? Well, if you go from Jackson to Vicksburg, and then go up 55 on one side and up to Yazoo City on the other, it's a little over 40 miles in a square. That's the size of Galilee. So Jesus comes and he begins to teach in a region that's about the size of that square. And we'll see as we look a little later that he goes from Nazareth to Capernaum. That's around 20 miles. That's like here to Gluckstadt. So that's the scope of where he is. He's beginning to teach and beginning to preach. And word quickly spreads all over about the things he's doing, about what he's saying, and then about the healing work. And he goes to Nazareth, which is in the latter part now of chapter 4. 5 is where we're going to do our sermon text. Uh, he goes there and goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And as is usual, they open the scroll. He begins to read. And he reads the announcement of the servant of the Lord from Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. He announces the work of the Messiah. And that's, of course, precisely what he's doing. After he had read that, he rolled back the scroll. Uh, in those days, you would stand to read the scripture and then you sit in order to uh, preach. And that's the way the Jews acknowledge the power of the word of God and then the speaker interpreting it. So Jesus stands to read it, sits down, and he says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. So he reads the statement, the great statement of the coming anointed one, sits down and says, all right, that's what happened today. That's what's happening now. The Lord's anointed is here. Now, People of Nazareth were a little surprised. Isn't this, isn't this Joseph's son? Don't we know him? And they're, they're listening, really pretty astounded at what he's saying and its power. They're also aware that he's been moving around the countryside healing people, casting out demons. We have hospitals. We pray for the doctors and for the sick. They didn't have anything like our hospitals. When they got sick, they were sick. And here you have Jesus who's walking around, putting his hands on people, and they're made well. Do you think that was attractive? Oh, my. Would you like that kind of an itinerant doctor to arrive in your city? Oh, boy, did they. So he would come preach, and his words were powerful. But more than that, as the text will say, he taught with authority, healing, casting out demons. He didn't just talk about, he had power that, that no one had ever had. And so as he arrived places, people wanted him to come. I'm, I'm going to bring you all my sick. Help, deal with us. And so he gets to his hometown. He's a hometown boy. What do you think they're expecting? We actually learn. Here he is. He teaches, and, and they're impressed, and they're wanting him to hang around and fix things. What was their interest in Jesus and his message? Primarily, he does nice things for them. They really wanted this. And I understand they're wanting it. And often, kind of, it's easy for us to think about God as one who does nice things for us. And he is gracious. But Jesus wasn't coming just to be a doer of nice things. And so he stands in front of the people of Nazareth, having preached. Then he says, surely you'll quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we heard you did in Capernaum. So he just directly speaks to their interest. So what you're going to say is, hey, heal us. And then he continues, I'll tell you the truth. No prophet is accepted in his own hometown. And I assure you, there are a lot of widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. And yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. 
There were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So as he stands in front of them, they're glad to see him, they like his message, and would you please get on with your business? And he says, you know, I'm not going to heal anybody here. I've not been sent to do that here. And they are furious. They are livid. It's your own hometown. Do these things. And then we read, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and drove him out of the town. They took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him over the cliff. How angry is this mob? They are totally wound. He won't do what we want. He won't heal here. And they're planning on killing him in their rage and sense of betrayal. The message he brought was really not well received. And when he didn't do the healings they wanted, they didn't want any part of him. And Luke carefully describes this beginning of Jesus' ministry in his hometown and the way he's received. Announce the gospel, and people are interested in the demonstration of the kingdom's power rather than the kingdom. Luke goes on to talk about <clears throat> Jesus going down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. So he goes about 20 miles down by the edge of the... Uh, lake. And there he begins to teach again, and they were amazed at his teaching because his message was with authority. The rabbis would say, oh, the scripture says, and Jesus says, I say to you. And not only does he say to them, he heals. He teaches with authority and with power, and they're impressed. And he begins to cast out demons, commanding them to come out and not to talk about who he is. And the people are amazed again. All the people were amazed and said to each other, what is this teaching? It's with authority and power. He gives orders to evil spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the whole region. You bet it did. Can you imagine this going around in an area that's maybe 40 by 40 miles? And he's down by the ocean or the sea, where the, the, this big lake, uh, where there's a lot of transit. So the word goes out. And Luke is showing us the rejection of his message, the impressiveness and question of his message, and then he takes us to Jesus' visit to Peter's mother-in-law. <clears throat> so we're broad, we've narrowed down, we're in Capernaum, uh, and we learn about Jesus' visit to Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. And they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up right away and began to wait on them. So here's Jesus going to this one home. Remember, we'd heard about, actually, one family that was healed. And now in Capernaum, we're focusing on one particular family. And when Jesus heals, she doesn't get up for an eight-week recovery. She gets up, and she starts to wait on them. So Luke carefully shows us this experience where Peter sees the power of Christ in his own in-law's home. Now, we, we joke about mothers-in-law. It's not clear that uh, in Jesus' time anybody talked that way about mothers-in-law. So if you're a mother-in-law, and I, I'm a father-in-law, and my wife is a mother-in-law, um, they don't get ridiculed as much. But here, they want help for Peter's mother-in-law, and he watches Jesus' help. Then the sun sets, and they brought to Jesus all kinds of people with various sicknesses, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out, shouting, You're the Son of God, and he rebuked them that they wouldn't be allowed to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. And then the daybreak comes, Jesus moves away to pray, and then he comes back and says, I have to move now to various towns because that's my job. My job is to announce the gospel in various places. So he leaves Capernaum and begins to be preaching in the towns around. So Luke has given us this picture of Jesus developing ministry, and then he goes to chapter 5 where we are brought into a particular piece of it where Jesus brings his message home to Peter. Now you want to think about old Peter here. Word has gone around. He's not confused about what Jesus can do. He's seen it in his own home. So now Jesus, the preacher, is down by the edge of the ocean, and he seems to have, or big lake, they call it Sea of Gennesaret, but it's, it's really a very, very large lake. 
Um, <clears throat> he seems to have done this regularly. If you stand on the shore, you've got the water behind you, and then the bank will rise up, and the people can sit on it. So it's kind of a natural amphitheater. Here we've, we've moved the pulpit up so I can you know, see if I were down there, you guys in the back couldn't see me, I'm not even near tall enough for that. Uh, and then we put people up on the side so that way more people can see. Well, Jesus didn't have a church building like this, but he seems to have worked frequently on the shores of the lake and then the people would sit up on the hillside. So that's what he's doing. Uh, and we'll just move into the passage. And one day Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him, listening to the word of God. So the, the crowd is moving up, hearing what he preaches. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were mending their nets. So he's doing the preaching, and over here to the side, there are a couple of boats, fishermen's boats. And these are pretty good-sized boats. Uh, they're over there, and the fishermen are actually behind them fixing their nets. In those days, they didn't have nylon nets. They used twine and string. And you know, you put that in and you work it a while, it's gonna tear when you use it. So they would bring them in and as they uh, brought the fish in, a after they'd bring the nets piece by piece into the back of the boat, sometimes had a platform on the, on the end of it or, or down in it, they fold the nets over, fold the nets over, and when they get to land, they start pulling the nets out, and they look for tears and fix them, look for tears and fix them. <clears throat> if there's uh, seaweed uh, in them, they pull it out, because that kind of is a giveaway, you've got a net. So they're sitting there fixing their nets, having used them the night before, and they're doing their mending. Now, <clears throat> you want to think about how attentive young, well, he wasn't all that young, but Mr. Peter was. Jesus is sitting there preaching. What is Peter doing? He's fixing his nets. It's kind of like I'm going to do my accounting while I watch TV. Or we have here iPhones. And so you can sit here, check your iPhone while the preacher goes on. Or in classes, that happens too. So here's Peter. <clears throat> Jesus over here teaching, and Peter's fixing his net. I, I'm guessing he wasn't listening very carefully. I think the time will come when we can check. There are all kinds of questions I've got. But for the moment, all we know is he was over there. So Jesus looks at him and says, hey, um, let me go out in your boat. Put out a little way from the shore, and I'm going to teach. So Peter flops his nets back up in the boat. He and perhaps his partner, or perhaps alone, they push it off the shore. They walk the boat out a ways, not too deep, but out a ways. And then Jesus is able to stand on the water and he'll project better and the people who are crowding in will be able to see him better. So he's got a, a nice place from which to preach. And I want you to think about Peter. What has he quietly done to Peter? Well, sometimes people sit up here in the front of this auditorium. And you know, when you sit here, nobody sees you until you move. And the minute you move, by all those eyes are on you, if you sneeze, if you blow your nose, all those eyes are on you. So here the Lord has invited Peter, come out, row the boat out. And Jesus is sitting teaching, and old Peter, man, you can't fix your, net, fix your nets when everybody's looking at you. So I suspect in a way he hadn't been, Peter is now listening. What is he thinking? Well, he's kind of heard about Jesus, and Jesus is teaching, and He's done things with his mother-in-law. We don't know what questions Peter has, but we do know he had to be out in the boat. And then Jesus finishes. When Jesus finishes, he says, Peter, um, come out into the deep water. They're sort of in the shallows by the edge of the lake. Come out in the deep water, put you on your nets for a catch. Peter says, teacher, we fished all night and we caught nothing. Peter is a professional fisherman. He's got nets that are kind of heavy. What happens when you put a big old net down in the water in the middle of the day? The fish take one look and they go that way. And they have little things on their side that let them know when something's out there. And in the, even at night, they can pick up the nets a little bit. Peter's a pro and Jesus is the visiting minister. Hey, let's go fishing. Teacher, we didn't ca all night, we didn't catch anything. But okay, if you want to put the nets out, we'll do that. And it looks that that was pretty much his attitude. I uh, 
used to fish a little bit in, in South Florida when we lived there. And we'd go out in our boat, put the anchor down, try catching fish. Some days we caught a lot, some days we caught none. I always liked it when we caught more. <clears throat> my kids liked it when we caught more. But my middle son uh, has begun to study fishing. That's probably a good idea. And he said, you know, Dad, <clears throat> when you go down on the shore, he's in Mobile now, you don't just go along and put your anchor down somewhere. You look for the water is running between the uh, uh, sandbars. You know how that is. You walk off the beach and it gets deeper and then there's a sandbar. And, and I knew you fished just outside the sandbar. And he said, no, Dad, actually what you do is you look for a cut in the sandbar where all the water goes through. The predators all sit by the cut. So he catches fish a lot. I caught him sometimes when we went fishing together. Uh, and Peter is very much in that attitude. Look, you, you, you catch fish at night, you catch them morning and evening, but middle of the day, that's not when you go fishing. If you want to do it, we'll do it. Visiting rabbis, you know, they can, they can have fun. I remember once I was preaching and they said, would you like to go dove hunting? I said, sure, I'll do that. They all knew how to use their shotgun and I just, you know. <laughs> but it was kind of fun. The birds flew all over. And actually, I, I have another son who's very, very, he's a sniper. And when he dove hunts, they all fall when I, you know, and, and I go out and I hit a few. Can't figure out quite how to sight that thing. But uh, we'll take the rabbi out. He can go fishing. Fine. We'll put our nets down. What the heck? <clears throat> so they're down. And the way you do it is you go over to a spot and then you start putting the nets out. And you take the boat in a big circle, big, big arc like that, and you're putting the nets down. And the nets are pretty tall nets, floats at the top, weights at the bottom. So you're putting an arched wall of net out in the water. And it has ropes at the end that you've got to your boat. So when you finish going around, then you begin to pull the nets in. And if there are any fish in the middle of the ark, you catch some fish. They aren't as clever as people. They actually don't swim down and under. They tend to want to go horizontal. That's why you've got nets. So Peter puts out the nets. And you can imagine him thinking, all right, you know, I'll bring these things back. I'll have to fix them up a little bit. But OK, I'll do it for the rabbi. Maybe we'll catch some fish. He likes that. And then as they're pulling him in, Peter begins to feel. I don't know if you've ever felt a fish hit a net. But when that net is taut, we've learned to use very small nets, um, you can feel it hit. The, the ropes are taut. You feel that fish. I got one. And Peter's out here. He thinks, there are a few out here. And then it begins like that. The fish all over the place. This doesn't happen in the middle of the day. They're down where it's cold, but the net is filling. Well, Peter, you know, this is a bonanza. This is weeks worth of fish. You, you, you can't retire on it, but you can sure buy something new for your home on this kind of load of fish. And so he pulls the thing in, and he's tossing the fish into the boat just fast as he can go. I mean, what else would you do? And so Peter's tossing him in, tossing him in, to and he realizes there are a lot of fish here. Calls to his friends, hey, come on out. We've got a lot of fish. So they row out, and they're all tossing fish as fast as they can into their boats, focusing on the fish and their catch. And this is great. And as they do it, the boats are filling. So the boats are going, you know what happens when you fill a boat, right? It goes lower and lower. <clears throat> well, they're getting full, which means the gunwales are getting near the water. And it's at this point that Peter kind of stops to think. Now, Peter's wonderful. He gets his whole self in gear before his brain. And he does that when he says, let me walk on the water. And he gets out and he says, deep panics. He wonderfully does that kind of thing, and maybe if I get another chance, we'll preach on it, but as you come to John 21, <clears throat> they'll all ditch you, I'll never forsake you, and then, of course, when he has the servant girl say, aren't you with him? Peter begins to curse and swear, I don't know that guy, never saw him. Peter's just great. <laughs> he, where is your gut? Bam, out that comes. And so here he is, and two boats are now going down. I would guess he has never seen a haul of fish like this. And that he was thinking, wonderful shares. And then it dawns on him, wait a minute, wait a minute. How is it that in the middle of the day, we are sinking in fish? Suddenly it dawns on him. Who is it that can take you out in the middle of the day and call the fish into your net in quantities that you didn't even know existed? 
suddenly Peter, Peter realizes, whoa, I'm in here with the Lord of the fishes. And then he's terrified. Why is he so scared? He's scared because the Holy One of Israel is coming. We're to prepare the way. And it suddenly dawns on Peter, I am in a boat with him. And Peter becomes intensely aware, I am not clean. And the text is marvelous. Peter falls at Jesus' knees and he says, leave me, I'm a sinful man. Okay, now you want to think about this. They're out in the middle of a great big lake. Ah, and a boat's going down. And the text actually says he's holding on to Jesus' knees. So he's fallen down before him. He's grabbed a hold of him. Go away. I'm sinful. And his hands are saying, I desperately want a relationship with you. But, I, I, but I'm sinful. And so here he's caught. And this is a place that some of us know. Jesus has chosen to walk up into the area of Peter's pride and knowledge. And right there to have his impact. And some of us, I certainly do remember the first time I moved from, oh, maybe there's God, into dealing with the God who is there. And that, that is a scary place. Holiness looks very different when you think of this one who knows everything. If God ran a video of our lives, an audio of our words of morality, um, he wouldn't need to judge us at all. He'd just say, we'll play the tape of all your moral judgments, we'll run the tape of what you did, and the discussion's over. Holy God would rightly judge all of us. The good news is not, oh, you made some mistakes in life. The good news is we have earned the judgment of God and Jesus took it. He doesn't wake up one day and say, oh, I didn't know about that in your life. Every single piece. Jesus misses nothing. The whole bill of indictment against us is nailed to the cross so we can be received. Guilt is a hard thing that we run from in our culture. Uh, when a president is involved with one of his staff, he says, I made a mistake. No, he didn't. He sinned. We minimize it, and we have no way to cover it. That's what Jesus is here to do. Go away from me. I'm sinful. Jesus understands that. That's the right place for Peter to begin. If I preach on John 21, we'll look at Peter having to hit this again a little later after that problem of the crucifixion. Peter's kind of like us. He goes, confusion, confession, confusion, confession. He seems to get things clear, and then he loses sight. Have you recognized that? High points in our spiritual life where we draw close to the Lord, and then we kind of lose focus again. And he jerks our chain, calls us back up, have to deal with him again. Peter's very much like that. So depart from me. I am a sinful man. And he was right. He is a sinful man. Jesus turns to him. Don't be afraid kneeling, clinging on to the Holy One of Israel, recognizing your sinfulness, which is rightly terrifying. Don't be afraid. I will deal with that. From now on, Peter, you're going to be a fisher of men. Jesus has things for us to do. He has things for his people to do. He calls us to do that. He calls it knowing all our ugliness, all our sinfulness, some of our motions towards serving God, he calls sinful people to be his servants. If you're one of those who's come to a relationship with this Savior, the invitation here is to remember, to be grateful, and to ask, what, what has he got from me now? How can I glorify him now? And if you've never met this Savior, then the invitation is, you know what? He knows exactly who you are. He judges with total righteousness, and therefore you have no hope of yourself. But the living God has dealt with your sin to cover it so that it is gone. And the invitation is come. Come to a relationship with the living God who then says, I have work for you. Peter, put down your nets and follow me. And he says the same to all of us. Not put down our nets, but 
follow me. The beauty of what Luke has done is to carefully show the work of the Savior and to walk it all the way up to the point where he brings it into an individual life where a person confronts the holy God. We don't like standing in front of a human judge when we cannot defend ourselves. Try the living God. But then the transformation. This is now Heavenly Father is in the business of transforming us. God is wonderful. If you know him, be grateful. If you've never met him, there are a lot of people here who would be glad to share with you their coming to know this Savior. And after the service, there'll be people here to pray as intercessors with those who would like to talk. The elders and deacons would be glad to talk to you about dealing with this risen Lord. Let's take a moment to pray together. Lord of hosts, we're so grateful that you don't pretend, that you don't look the other way when we do things that are wrong, that instead of imaging you, distort your image. Lord, thank you that you don't look away, nor, Lord Jesus, did you come first to judge. Thank you for coming for Peter and for us to stand and take that judgment so we could be free and children of the living God. Lord, we look forward to the day when instead of the Lord's Supper in remembrance of your death, we'll be at the wedding supper of the Lamb to see and know and rejoice in our Savior. So we pray for your work in our midst. Thank you for what you've done. And Heavenly Father, we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.